Hey y'all, this is Brown at I have Brown, and yeah, I'm wearing blue, go figure, right? But I wanted to talk a little bit about one of my favorite bands, which is the Moody Blues. You know, blues, blue, hey, I just realized. <laughs> but um, yeah, they're one of my favorite bands, and I, I've been a fan of theirs since I was a kid, and my dad's the one who got me into them, so thanks, Dad. But the first time I remember, you know, listening to, you know, some of their stuff or seeing anything, you know, from them, like, say, music videos and what have you, uh, it was on a VHS tape my dad had, and he might still have it, uh, but it was called, a, I think it was called Moody Blues, uh, Legend of a Band, and, you know, basically it was kind of like a documentary, you know, which had, and it had interviews with the band members, and, um, you know, kind of followed them around, and, uh, and they talked about how um, the band got together and how it came to be, and also, uh, you know, the songwriting process of some of their, you know, big hits, and, you know, some of, some of the instances they were talking about what it was like, you know, upgrading from certain types of, uh, you know, musical techniques, you know, from one decade and going to another. And so, interspersed in between these interviews, uh, there were also, um, you know, music videos, you know, or, you know, concert performance videos, um, you know, of, you know, their, some of their big hits. And the majority of it consisted of stuff from the 80s, but they also had, you know, stuff from like the 60s and 70s, but, um, but it was mostly stuff from the 80s that they showed as far as the music videos go. And the 80s stuff is what I remember being the most prominent um, bit from the Moody Blues that I uh, was listening to, you know, because, I mean, I've always been fond of, you know, synthesizers, keyboards, like synth pop, synth rock, and, you know, their 80s stuff, I mean, definitely, you know, went from, you know, it, it went, you know, f back and forth between synth pop and synth rock, you know, and so, I mean, a lot of it was pretty good stuff, but as I got older, and I kind of, uh, I guess you could say, expanded my palate, as it were, uh, listening to different types of music or different types of rock and roll. I mean, you know, you got Pink Floyd, and Dark Side of the Moon. I mean, you know, great album. I mean, you got, you know, Bill Nelson and Bebop Deluxe. I mean, you know, you got different types of, you know, rock and roll, right? And so it wasn't, so I learned, so I came to realize realize and appreciate that there were there was more to music than just synth pop and synth rock you know and so I've really come to appreciate say like their classic lineup you know with um, you know Justin Hayward John Lodge uh, Graham Edge Ray Thomas and Mike Pender uh, and sadly uh, Ray Thomas and uh, Graham Edge are no longer with us they passed away you know a couple of years ago uh, but but yeah, so um, that was the classic lineup, though, and they, you know, the the albums that they put out. I mean, you listen to them, and even though you could tell that they're say, you know, from the '60s or '70s, I mean, the musical quality is timeless, and to some extent, you could make the argument that you know some of their output from the '80s, you know, could be called timeless as well. I mean even though you can tell it's from the 80s, you know, but it's like, you know, when, when, when you can tell what decade a song is from, but, you know, the quality, you know, basically transcends, you know, the fact that, oh yeah, it's totally from a certain decade, right? You know, it's like, oh yeah, this is totally from the 60s or obviously from the 70s or 80s or something like that. But, but I mean, I think their timeless music was more, say, from the 60s and 70s, I mean, with respect to the stuff from the 80s, because, you know, to me, a lot of, the, some of the 80s stuff, you know, still holds up and is still like, yeah, that's, that's some great stuff right there, uh, but their timeless stuff, though, I mean, you know, you got, you know, the albums like Days of Future Past, uh, In Search of the Lost Chord, uh, On the Threshold of a Dream, um, Question of Balance, Every Good Boy Deserves Favor, um, uh, seventh Sojourn, and uh, to our children's children. I mean, not necessarily. I mean, I, I don't think I got them all in order here, but I mean, those are, are the those were the albums, though, right? I mean, you listen to those albums. I mean, the music is just 
it's it, it takes you somewhere um and even though like for a time, I kind of got annoyed with the song Nights in White Satin. I mean, when I was a kid, let me emphasize. When I was a kid, I was kind of like, oh man, this is a sappy love song, or as much as I could say something like that when I was a little kid, right? Uh, but, you know, as I've gotten older though, you know, and I've, you know, had more life experience, you know, had relationships and what have you, you know, the emotional impact that that song had on so many people, I mean, yeah, I came to recognize that, and I also, you know, came to relate to that song, you know, especially with, say, um, in the realm of relationships and romance and lost love and what have you, and, you know, you got songs like that that's like, yeah, there's a reason that that song, you know, is considered, you know, a classic song, you know, e like, even if you're not a fan of the band, it's like, you know, songs like that, it's like, they get to you, you know, uh, Nights in White Satin, uh, Ride My Seesaw, uh, I mean, um, Melancholy Man, a uh, singer in a rock and roll band, Question, I mean, you know, it, it, just some great stuff. Um, but, and, and you get to the 80s though, and, you know, I think that, you know, because, you know, th there was a lot more emphasis on keyboards and synthesizers, you know, a band like the Moody Blues that was um, more, that was, that was especially prog rock, you know, with their 60s and 70s output, um, it's like they had an album, one more album before the 80s, um, I believe it was called Octave, and that was the last album that Mike Pender was with them on, and I don't remember if he quit or if he was, you know, let go from the band, you know, but, you know, basically it was a, it was a year or two before the 80s that Octave was put out and so when Mike Pender left you know they were needing a new keyboardist and um and so they uh they eventually ended up um coming into getting into contact with a guy by the name of Patrick Moraz who was a Swiss musician songwriter film composer and you know very good at his craft and um, he was with the, the band Yes uh, for one album. It was called Relayer, I believe. And, I mean, I've listened to some of the stuff from that album. And, you know, when it comes to, like, the keyboard stuff, it's like, damn, that's pretty good. Um, and I know that he was in a band called Refugee, but I am, unfortunately I have yet to, you know, listen to any of that stuff. But, like, that was the band that Patrick Moraz was with before he was with um, Yes for that one album. Uh, but, but in the, in the meantime, though, uh, after that, after the Relayer album, um, the Moody Blues, uh, and Patrick Moraz, I mean, they got into contact with one another and, um, you know, basically, you know, Patrick Moraz ended up auditioning and, you know, getting to spy as a keyboard player. And so, um, they were still in the process of touring, you know, for the Octave album. So even though Mike Pinder was, you know, the guy who did the keyboards on that particular album, you know, as I understand it, you know, when they were touring in support of the album, it was Patrick Moraz who was playing with the band, but he hadn't actually, you know, been on, you know, he hadn't actually been with the band when they'd, you know, done a whole album as of yet, but that changed with, um, a band called, I'm uh, sorry, a, a, an album called Long Distance Voyager, and that was their first album of the 80s, and it was the first, you know, full-on album that Patrick Moraz was with them on, and you listen to that album, and I think it's one of their best. I mean, yes, you could tell it's from the 80s because of the use of keyboards and synthesizers, but at the same time, though, at that point, they were trying to make a point to say, okay, yes, we kind of need to change with the times to some extent, but at the same time, we're a prog rock band. We need to keep some of that with us. You know, we can change, we can upgrade the equipment and what have you, but we can't ditch our roots and what have you. So, I mean, you know, you, you have, you know, classics like uh, uh, The Voice, um, Gemini Dream. I mean, you know, great stuff. And then, you know, you have a song like uh, Veteran Cosmic Rocker, which, I mean, that definitely goes back to, you know, their prog rock, you know, roots. And so it was a good balance. And, I mean, by the way, you know, Londis, uh, Londis's Voyager, 
I mean, if you get a chance, I mean, it's worth picking up. I mean, if you see it at a store, you know, on sale or something like that, pick it up. It's, it's, it's worth it. Um, so yeah, I mean, so basically that album, um, you know, established that the Moody Blues were still alive and kicking and they could still rock in the best way possible, right? And, you know, it basically, you know, um, allowed them to make their way into the 80s. And so, you know, Patrick Moraz, I mean, he was with them for three more albums. Uh, he was with them with, uh, after uh, Long Distance Voyager, uh, he was with them for, um, I think it was called uh, The Present, and then uh, The Other Side of Life, in Sir Le Moore, I hope I'm saying that last one right, but um, the other side of life in particular, I think is, you know, one of their, you know, best albums as well. So it's like you got Long Distance Voyager and The Other Side of Life. I mean, two of their, you know, albums, albums excuse me, albums from the 80s, you know, but a lot of their, you know, iconic stuff came from those two albums. I mean, that kind of um, fit in place with, you know, the stuff from their classics, um, you know, from, from their prog rock eras or prog rock days, if you will. And so, um, you know, the other side of life, I mean, you had songs like, uh, well, like the, the title song, the other side of life, which I mean, really cool song and, uh, really cool music video too. Very dark and atmospheric, both as a music video and as a song. And that was the other thing. Um, you know, the eighties, I mean, that was when, you know, everyone was trying to do music videos and it's like, if you have music videos like on MTV, you know, basically, you know, you, um, you are considered a cool band or a hot band, you know? And so Moody Blues, I mean, they got in on that. I mean, starting with, um, like Long Distance Voyager, they made a couple of promo videos, but then, uh, I think it was around uh, the other side of life that they actually had, you know, full on music videos. I mean, you had um, the other side of life um, and your wildest dreams. And I mean, so basically like those two music videos in particular went a long way towards, you know, bringing a new audience, you know, to uh, the Moody Blues. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, you, you, you had some really good stuff from the eighties you know, when Patrick Moraz was w with them. And I don't remember for sure if he did much in the way of so actual songwriting, but in terms of like the keyboards and stuff like that, I think he, in my opinion, like, he was very instrumental in helping the Moody Blues to um, maintain, I guess you could say, their you know, popularity or increase their popularity in some ways. What with you know using the synthesizers and keyboards, which were very you know popular in the decade of the '80s, and so I think you know not not to say like it was all Patrick Moraz is doing, but if Patrick Moraz hadn't been a part of the band at that point in time, their popularity wouldn't have um, been a, as strong. I, I don't think like. I'm sure like they'd still be able to play and what have you, but you know, without someone like Patrick Moraz at the helm of the synthesizers, I mean, which were a part of the decade of the eighties, I just don't think that the band would have, you know, continued to be as popular as it was, you know, from their sixties and seventies prog rock days, you know, but, but yeah, so I think that, um, it's like sixties, seventies and eighties. I mean, the Moody Blues had some great stuff. And so it's, it was fascinating, you know, looking back on, you know, from when I was, memories from when I was a kid, and then, you know, looking back on, okay, as I, as I got older and listened to more of their output, you really see how, you know, their music style changed. And so I think that, you know, from the 60s, 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s, I mean, you got some great stuff, some classic stuff, but like coming into the nineties though, I think they basically, I mean, they, they hit a, a slump as it were. I mean, I don't know the particulars, but just, uh, they, I, they did an album called keys. Uh, it was either keys to the kingdom or keys of the kingdom. And unfortunately that point was where things started to fall apart. Uh, because one of the, one of the downsides of say prior to that album, um, you know, the, the band member, Ray Thomas, 
um, his his input with the band, you know, became less and less. You know, uh, after I think it was a uh, in long distance Voyager. I mean, he still had a you know vital part to play. Um, like the song "Veteran Cosmic Rocker." I mean, that's that's his song, and it rocks. You know, um, as far as you know, like I guess you know songwriting and what have you, and um, the instrumental, like the harmonica and and what and but I mean, so you know, to a point in the '80s, he still had a part to play, but you know, he gradually had less and less input, though. You know, to a point of say, Sir Lamore. I mean, from what I understand, he just wasn't even, I mean, he was present, but he didn't really make any contributions to, to the album, I don't think, from what, from what I remember reading about. But, um, so you had that going on behind the scenes, um, you know, because he was the, initially like the flutist of the band. And so like, you know, flutist, tambourine player, um, and, you know, back like in their prog rock days, I mean, you know, he had a lot more input, but then, you know, come the 80s, though, I, I guess they're just, you know, they were, they had a hard time figuring out, okay, you know, how do we put, you know, a flutist in the, you know, front and center, you know, and so basically, you know, he just didn't have as much input, you know, and which is a bummer because, you know, he was pretty good. I mean, you know, back, you know, when, you know, they were mainly a prog rock band, but okay, so, so you had that going on, and then, uh, you got this, you know, bit where, you know, during the making of uh, Keys of the Kingdom, you know, Patrick Moraz was sacked from the band. And so, you know, whereas with the uh, prior four albums that he was with the band on, you know, he, uh, I mean, he was credited as a full-on member of the band. You know, you look at the press material, you look at the, you know, uh, the band member you know, listings and what have you, he was a full-on member of the band, but, you know, with uh, Keys to the Kingdom, or of the Kingdom, I need to double-check on that, um, I think he was list he was just listed as, you know, additional keyboardist, and he had only did, like, two, work on two or three songs, but, you know, the reason was, um, basically, he was, you know, sacked from the band, you know, while they were making it, I, I believe, and, the reason being was because, um, you know, he had done an interview, or I should say, I, the main reason that I believe he was sacked was because he did this interview with this keyboard magazine, and, you know, he was talking about how um, he was um, just kind of at a point where he was um, tired of playing with the band, uh, with the movie blues. Like he was talking about how, I mean, it was good when we started out and, you know, we had some good concerts together, but I feel like, you know, they've stagnated and I've done all I can with them. And, um, there's no challenge to, you know, being a part of the band. And so, I mean, it's like, okay, fair point. I mean, you, that's the point that you're at a point where you feel like, you know, you've only gone, you've gone as far as you can go with, you know, the band. So, you know, you're wanting to move on to other things. Okay. Well, here's the problem. He said this in an interview with a prominent music magazine where, you know, everyone and their mother could see it while he was still in the band. And so, you know, after that happened, you know, the Moody Blues, I mean, depending on who you talk to, you know, they either gradually phased him out or they, you know, fired him, you know, rather quickly after that interview. But it was after that interview, though, that he was fired from the band. And so, um, you know, so, so they had this, you know, trial that, um, if you want to, like, look online, like on YouTube or something like that, I mean, you know, it's a very long trial. I mean, I haven't actually watched it, but, you know, I, I've seen, um, that like clips listed and I've read like cliff notes versions of it. And, you know, it sounds like it was a total fiasco because, um, you know, he, Patrick Moraz, I mean, you know, he was, you know, he was saying one thing, you know, the band members were saying another thing and the lawyers were saying something else entirely for both sides, you know? And so as, as I, under, I understand it, um, Patrick Moraz, you know, was suing the band, you know, for, um, 
you know, five hundred thousand dollars, you know, that you know he felt he was owed, you know, because you know, as as a as a member of the band, you know, there were certain royalties that you know he felt he was entitled to, and you know, considering that they fired him, I mean, it's like okay, he might have some grounds there. Um, but then, it, then again, you got the movie Blues, you know, the band members saying that, you know, there was, um, like, there was something about, you know, contract and, you know, saying that, you know, he, you know, was just a, um, a touring band member or something like that. Like, he wasn't a full-on band member, despite the fact that he was listed as a band member. So, you know, there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of contradictory stuff on both sides, you know, from what, you know, I remember reading about it. And it just, it sounds like in this instance, you know, both sides, you know, kind of came off looking like dicks. And I hate to say that because, I mean, they're one of my favorite bands, but at the same time, it's like, well, I mean, if you're being a dick, I mean, regardless of, you know, you know, how, how much, you know, one, you know, is a fan of the band. I mean, it's like, if you're being a dick, I mean, yeah, you're being a dick, but, you know, basically, um, Patrick Moraz was wanting five hundred thousand dollars, I believe, but and uh, before the trial started, uh, he was actually offered uh, by the band through a lawyer, I believe it was, um, four hundred thousand dollars. You know, basically to settle out of court. But instead, you know, he instead of taking the offer, uh, he took the band to court, and you know, basically, you know, wanting more than that. And so, um, what ended up happening was, amongst other things, like he had his lawyer, you know, from what I've you know, read about him, you know, basically made things even more confusing, you know, for, you know, the court and, you know, the people who were on the stand, you know, you know, and so basically, you know, you had a lawyer who wasn't making a whole lot of sense. And then you had, you know, the band members who were constantly, um, contradicting themselves or conveniently forgetting certain things or, you know, remembering things, you know, a different way as to how they actually happened. And so, um, and there was a, there was some stuff like that on both sides to be fair from, you know, where I remember reading about it, you know, but it just, no one came across looking like a good guy, so to speak. And, um, what ultimately ended up happening was Patrick Moraz ended up winning the case but he only got something like $77,000, you know, which is a far cry from the, you know, $500,000 he was wanting, as well as the $400,000 that he was offered to sell out of court. So I thought it was, you know, reading about it and listening to some people talk about it, it was just really sad, you know, for me because, I mean, considering that, you know, the 80s, you know, Patrick Moraz era is the, you know, output of the Moody Blues that I generally remember growing up on, and I have a lot of fondness for that era, it's sad to know that, you know, it didn't end well. And, I mean, and, and Patrick Moraz left the band on bad terms. And also, you know, the band members themselves kind of ended up looking like dicks because of their behavior in the courtroom, as far as them, you know, contradicting themselves or, you know, saying stuff that, you know, you know, basically, um, it just, it didn't make them look good. So when it's one of your favorite, you know, artists that is having that kind of behavior, it's rather, rather disheartening. But you know, at the same time though, here's the thing. While I sympathize with Patrick Moraz, I mean, considering the fact that he was, you know, a full on band member, you know, for, you know, four albums and, you know, had a lot to do with, you know, helping them to, um, still be, you know, prominent in the eighties. I mean, I sympathize with him in that regard. And I think that, you know, he definitely should have had a better outcome as far as, you know, his winnings in court, you know, and I think that, you know, maybe, you know, him at the very least, you know, settling out of court in hindsight would have been the better option for him. I think a lot of this could have been avoided if he had not given that interview in the, to the keyboard magazine, because while he was speaking honestly, you know, how he really felt, he really shouldn't have, you know, said that 
you know, to the press, which, you know, the magazine was essentially a form of, and he especially shouldn't have said that while he was still a member of the band, you know, because you do that, you know, you're just asking to be kicked out of the band because, you know, I remember, you know, this one writer was talking about how, you know, Patrick Moraz, you know, basically, you know, took a chapter from, you know, how to, you know, alienate your bandmates and burn all the bridges you have. And so, so yeah, Patrick Moraz definitely screwed up in that regard. And I think that, um, while I definitely can understand why as an artist, he felt like, you know, he had gone as far as he could with the band and, you know, he was no longer feeling, you know, like there was a challenge. I think that he, uh, could have handled the thing a whole lot better. Like, you know, maybe, you know, if he had talked with the band in private and said, you know, basically like, Hey guys, uh, I, you know, it's been fun, but you know, I'm, I'm wanting to, you know, move on to other things. And I feel like I've gone as far as I can go here. And, you know, you know, what can we do? You know, that kind of thing. Like if he had talked with the band, you know, in private, like, and just, you know, been honest with them, you know, as opposed to say doing that interview where he basically, you know, trashed them in public while he was still a member of the band and, you know, basically biting the hand that fed him. I mean, if he had done, you know, I guess if he had done something other than that, it would have gone a whole lot differently. Like if he had just talked to them, I think, you know, in private, I think that maybe the band, I mean, they might've been disappointed or kind of like, wait a minute, you're quitting, you know, or something like that. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, there'd be disappointment and they'd be flustered for sure, but they probably wouldn't have been outright pissed at him, you know, as they were when he did that interview. Like if he had just talked to him, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I think that they probably would have just said, okay, you know, we understand, you know, it's been fun, blah, 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 blah. You know, here's, you know, your royalties or what have you. Of course, you have to go through lawyers on stuff like that still, but at the same time, there probably wouldn't have been, you know, any or as much bad blood as there was, you know, when the thing went to trial. So, I mean, I think that there was blame on both sides in that regard, you know, both on Patrick Moraz and on the band members as well, because I understand the band members, you know, being very pissed off at, you know, one of their own, you know, you know, trashing them in public, you know, while he's, you know, with them, you know, and making money, you know, you know, with them too. But, you know, I also understand where Patrick Moraz was coming from as far as needing to move on to other pastures. So it just sounds like that both sides really, you know, mishandled the thing. And so as a result, I mean, you had, you know, a, a really good band having a fantastic run across three decades and unfortunately ending, you know, the, the next decade, the nineties on a sour note. And so, I mean, they, they still, you know, played together and everything. I mean, minus Patrick Moraz, you know, but, you know, after that trial though, you know, they went out of their way to basically omit Patrick Moraz from any sort of reprints from, you know, their eighties output, you know? So it's like, you know, any pictures of him, uh, and any sort of reissues, you know, of CDs from the eighties were, they would basically omit pictures, you know, of Patrick Moraz, whereas like the original albums would have pictures of him with the band and have him listed as a full on member of the band. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, definitely some pettiness there, but, uh, but yeah, just, it's sad how, you know, that, you know, partnership ended though, but it just feels like there was blame on both sides there. So anyway, yeah, I, I gotta, you know, get back to work here, but, um, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Uh, you know, y'all got any feedback, um, some input there, uh, any fellow movies, blues fans love to hear from y'all. So y'all take care, have a good day. And if you like what you see here, please feel free to like and subscribe. So y'all have a good weekend. Bye.